interoperability the dictionary definition of interoperability is the ability of computer systems or software to exchange and make use of the information in the us although more than 95 percent of hospitals and 75 percent of office-based clinicians are utilizing certified health IT. Challenges remain in creating a comprehensive longitudinal view of a patient's health history. This results in a poor quality of patient care. And the solution is interoperability, which will lead to improved patient care and safety. With that in mind, let's dive into today's discussion on building an integrated healthcare platform with FHIR. Good morning, good after, afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm Nirmal Fernando, a senior lead solutions engineer of WSO2 Solutions Architecture team. We are working with numerous healthcare customers, partners, and I am excited to share our experience with you today. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This is a start of a webinar series, and the next webinar will be on 23rd of July. You'll get an update on it post this webinar. Slides and recording will be shared within a day or two after the webinar. You can ask questions at any time using the questions tab, uh, and we'll be uh, answering them during the course of the webinar, as well as uh, at the end of the webinar. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's get to the content of the session. In today's session, uh, there are three main parts. Firstly, uh, we'll look into the basics of uh, FHIR, then we'll discuss the design considerations when uh, building a healthcare uh, integration platform. And at last, we will uh, demonstrate uh, how WSOT can help you in your interoperability journey. So uh, FHIR stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. A little bit of history uh, on the uh, fire uh, specification, how it evolved throughout the years. HL7 organization is the organization behind the uh, uh, interoperability standard uh, for the healthcare. And they released the very first release in 1987. Uh, that's the first version of uh, uh, HL7 V2. And then they continue to release improvements uh, and uh, in 2011, they released HL7 v2.7, uh, which is uh, widely used right now uh, across the uh, healthcare organizations. They re released the HL7 version 3 as well uh, in the middle. Uh, and then at, you know, uh, in 2014, they have released the first uh, draft uh, standard uh, for trial use. Uh, of the FHIR uh, standards in 2014. And then uh, in 2015, they released the DSTU2 of the FHIR standards. And uh, basically uh, in 2019, they uh, released the latest uh, FHIR uh, normative 401 uh, version. More than 90% of US healthcare organizations use HL7V2 uh, V2 versions uh, right now, and more than 35 countries have HL7 V2 based uh, implementations. Why FHIR is uh, better? So let's uh, go through a few uh, things uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, would uh, you know tell us why FHIR is better than the uh, previous versions of the interoperability HL7 uh, standards. Uh, FHIR is basically focusing uh, or the specification is built by uh, giving a huge focus onto the implementation of it. So the ease of uh, implementation and the fast implementation, one of the key uh, ingredients in the FHIR specification. 
interoperability is provided out of the box with the fire specification base resources can be used as is but uh, you know they can also be adapted as needed which basically ha happens a lot uh, for a lot uh, for local requirements uh, using uh, profiles and extensions you can extend the fire specification fire leverages the latest web standards uh, and basically supports modern uh, technologies like uh, XML, JSON, HTTP, Auth2. And it basically allows you to seamlessly exchange uh, messages. Uh, and uh, you, you can deploy these fire resources in a service-oriented uh, architecture since it supports a RESTful uh, services architecture. You can understand uh, easily the specification and it is up to the point. So if you go to the HL7 uh, website, uh, it has a clear set of instructions on how you can uh, read uh, the fire specification and understand it better. Uh, and the serialization format that fire supports is human readable. Uh, which makes it easy uh, for the developers to use uh, the fire uh, and basically uh, build their applications and services. Let's discuss a few architectural principles behind uh, fire. Um, so, hold on. Uh, first is the reuse and composability. Fire resources are designed with the 80-20 rule in mind that is basically focusing on the 20% of requirements that uh, satisfy 80% of the interoperability needs. <clears throat> Fire resources are highly composable in that resources commonly refer to other resources. Uh, this basically further promotes reuse and allow, allows for complex structures to be built from more atomic resources. Basically, you can add references if you have a, a, a explanation of benefit or a claim fire resource. There are references uh, for the patient, for the organization, etc. cetera, uh, within that particular resource that makes it uh, highly composable and uh, that encourages the reusability of the fire resources. Next point is the scalability. Uh, aligning fire APIs to the REST standard basically allows uh, you to uh, you know, build stateless uh, messages, stateless APIs that will inherently reduce memory and basically eliminates the need of sticky sessions. So within a server cluster, you can basically uh, deploy fire APIs without having any uh, session stickiness. That means you can scale the fire APIs horizontally uh, without uh, you know, uh, having a issue of the scalability of your APIs. The performance is also a key uh, uh, architectural uh, principle behind fire. Fire resources are lean and basically they are suitable for exchanging across the network due to that particular nature. Usability. Fire basically, uh, fire resources are understood by technical experts as well as non technical people, uh, both alike. You know, they, even though you are from the healthcare domain or in a typical technical domain, you can basically understand a fire resource by looking at the specification or looking at the serialized uh, format of it. A fire is strongly tight and has mechanisms built for clinical terminology validation. So uh, in addition to XML, uh, JSON documents uh, can be validated uh, and basically uh, you can syntactically as well as semantically validate uh, the business objects the, uh, the business objects that are exposed via the fire resources uh, using the fire standard. And the one 
of the driving forces for fire is the need to create and standard uh, with high adoption uh, across disparate developer communities. Fire is easily understood and readily implemented using industry standards and commonly markup and data exchange technology. So let's move into the next slide. Uh, in its core, uh, fire has basically two main components, uh, fire resources. Uh, those are directly uh, correlated with the healthcare uh, objects, healthcare business objects. For an example, in a typical healthcare system, you have an entity called patient, you have an entity called uh, claim. Uh, so there's a corresponding fire resource uh, that uh, defines uh, the common uh, general uh, attributes of a patient, uh, of a claim, and uh, basically for most of the healthcare business objects. And the other component is the REST API. Uh, as I explained earlier, why fire is better is one of the reasons is it has a, a latest, it supports latest web standard. So you can, expo you can expose it as a REST API and uh, basically consume uh, from latest, uh, using latest web technologies. So the REST API will basically help you uh, to uh, expose your fire resources to your uh, application developers. And it the fire specification defines what are the resources that you should uh, expose. And um, uh, basically the API uh, operations is standard. Uh, it's like defined for all the resources, but uh, you as a fire server or a fire API provider can decide what are, what are the resources that you would like to expose. Fire resources are organized in a layered uh, resource architecture. So at the very first layer, there are a set of foundation resources. Those are the ba uh, you know, very basic fire resources that are not being used uh, or not being directly correlated to the uh, healthcare uh, uh, business objects but those are fundamental requirements to build the other uh, fire resources. And there's this base resource layer, which is the mostly referenced uh, set of fire resources. Uh, and uh, basically the uh, you know, patient, all these uh, main uh, resources that, that would be required for any other uh, uh, higher layers will be uh, defined in the base resource segment. Then there's clinical uh, financial uh, resources uh, for clinical uh, side of things. Uh, you, you have the explanation of benefit uh, and all the other resources that uh, you can categorize as clinical resources. And there are financial resources like uh, claim um, uh, and uh, billing uh, related uh, fire resources are also uh, categorized to the layer four. So the important thing to understand is uh, if you are in a, in a single layer, fire specification recommend uh, that you reference uh, the resources that are in the same layer or the layers higher uh, than the uh, layer that you are currently in. So this is a best practice that FHIR uh, recommends, but um, it's not a, like a mandatory requirement in the specification. So the, this is the resource structure. So uh, as you can see, the foundation base clinical financial resource layer is there. And uh, I have taken the patient FHIR resource uh, UML uh, diagram from the uh, FHIR website, HSO website. And, uh, this is basically to give you an idea on what sort of resources are available right now. Uh, of course, you can uh, check it out uh, by the website. Let's talk about the Fire RESTful API. Uh, so it is currently at the uh, le level two maturity level uh, for the REST uh, standards. Uh, so, uh, but that is sufficiently enough for you to go and implement uh, APIs RESTful APIs uh, and expose uh, fire messages 
uh, to your application developers. So when it comes to the FireST API, uh, there are three levels of uh, interactions. The first level is basically the type level interaction. Here, uh, you basically operate on a fire resource type and the, uh, the specification uh, basically uh, uh, says you can expose, create, search, history uh, operations out of it. Uh, but you have the freedom to decide uh, to you know which operations you would uh, expose so here you can see an example it's uh, this is the claim api and you have a search operation that's the get operation and then you have a create operation and this is operated at the type level so you basically do http call to the claim uh, and say and ask the fire server to create a claim, new claim, or retrieve all the claims. The second level of interaction is at the instance level. Once you created a fire uh, object by calling a fire server, you would call it an fire resource instance. So on an instance, uh, basically there's a mandatory uh, logical ID that the server should provide to you. Uh, when you do a post call to the resource, you would get this ID. And then you can use this ID to reference the uh, instance and then basically uh, do certain set of uh, REST operations uh, on top of uh, that particular instance. So again, uh, there are several operations that the REST API, uh, the specification mandates, uh, history, uh, search, uh, are two main, main operations. And the third uh, level of interaction is the, as a whole system, you have to provide a REST API interface, uh, which is mainly about the capabilities of your fire server. Uh, and also there's an option uh, to expose a search and history operation. But uh, I think the most, uh, you know, important thing is the capability statement. So if you go to a, any fire server today, and if you want to understand what sort of fire operations and resources that particular fire server supports, you can issue a get operation uh, onto the metadata URL of the fire server. And then you would, uh, you should be getting a capability statement from the server explaining what are the resources that are supported by the server. Here I've listed a uh, wiki uh, page link uh, to uh, publicly available test uh, fire servers. But the thing to notice, these are just uh, for the testing and just to get a uh, feel about the fire specification and the fire REST API. Uh, these are not suitable for the production uh, usage. Uh, as I explained previously as well, one of the fundamental part of designing uh, the fire specification is basically the extensibility uh, of the uh, uh, specification. So fire, each fire resource basically have a element that is, that's an optional element that basically denotes uh, or uh, allow you to way to plug any extension to the fire resource. So uh, why this is required? Uh, there's an international fire standard that was basically built by analyzing the general common uh, healthcare business objects. But uh, as you can imagine, uh, based on the different regions, uh, regional bodies, uh, government, uh, uh, behaviors, etc. Uh, they would determine, or they would have a need uh, or a requirement to basically uh, extend the fire resources and add new fields, uh, create new uh, business objects uh, on top of the base fire resources. So this is a key uh, element to fire. And uh, when you are evaluating fire solutions as well, this is a key condition consideration that you have to take into account whether the 
solution that you are trying to uh, you know use or uh, buy basically whether it supports the extensibility whether it can build you the fire accelerators uh, for your extensions that you may have in near future Let, let's uh, look at so that basically ends the first uh, section first part of the uh, session and now let's look at uh, how uh, what are the design and implementation considerations that you have to uh, consider when building an integrated uh, healthcare uh, platform uh, with fire so the first uh, design consideration I've jotted down here is basically the future proof of the integration platform that you would select. So the platform you select today basically to build your healthcare solution should be uh, future proof. You shouldn't be tightly coupled to any infrastructure provider that would hinder uh, your uh, ability to move to a dif different uh, cloud uh, or infrastructure uh, that would come in future uh, that is much way better than the current existing infrastructure. So that's one thing you have to consider. And uh, also you should be able to deploy your healthcare solution uh, to accommodate different architectural patterns. Uh, for an example, now we have the uh, you know uh, standard centralized uh, deployment patterns as well as decentralized uh, services uh, patterns. So your solution should be supporting both uh, architectural patterns, and that would be a key uh, key decision, uh, key consideration when you uh, decide on a solution. And extensibility of the uh, platform. So uh, you know the solution that you are picking right now should basically able to support different message formats, uh, different uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, re regulatory requirements that you may get in uh, the future. So your product should have uh, uh, proper interfaces, pro proper extension points that would allow you to uh, integrate uh, and extend the key uh, functionality. Stability of the technology is a crucial factor as well. Uh, there are a lot of niche uh, niche uh, healthcare solutions out there, uh, but uh, I think uh, you shouldn't think of this as a, like a temporary uh, solution that you are building, but this would be a solution that would be permanent and would there for many years to come. So the stability, uh, the provenness of your platform that you are uh, uh, basically start to uh, use uh, in order to build your healthcare solution is a key uh, factor. Deployment restrictions, uh, so the uh, platform you select uh, should be uh, able to deploy anywhere. Uh, it should uh, be only restricted to virtual machines or to a certain limited uh, deployment architecture. You should have the freedom to deploy it uh, based on the requirements and uh, based on the demand that you'd get uh, Ability to fit into the uh, existing ecosystem. So a typical example would be you you would be already having an identity provider uh, or a authentication or a authorization server in house. So the solution or the platform that you are uh, picking or uh, you know choosing in order to build your healthcare platform should basically be able to connect or integrate seamlessly with your existing ecosystem and uh, uh, work together. Otherwise, you would have to invest a lot of, lot of money uh, to duplicate uh, the same features uh, in, within your organization. Full lifecycle API management and API security. So as you know, the fire basically uh, introduce the RESTful API. That means uh, this is quite similar to a standard uh, normal uh, API. So all the uh, features uh, that you would uh, require when you are exposing an API to the external parties are relevant to fire APIs as well. 
few uh, uh, few uh, such uh, features would be the rate limiting features, the security, the governance of your APIs are critical uh, piece of uh, you know features, and you should evaluate those. Uh, so if you are going with going ahead with a full lifecycle API management solution, you would have all those features. Fire accelerators are a crucial uh, enabler uh, of your organization. So you may have uh, different data systems, uh, data sources, but uh, you'd, you'd be, uh, you have to transform them to the new fire format uh, and for the fire R4 standards. So if you are familiar with the fire resources, they have like a lot of attributes. So transforming them uh, using the traditional methods would take, consume a lot of time from your development team. And it would basically, uh, you know, not be very productive. So having a set of fire accelerators is a key uh, decision uh, or a consideration that sh you should uh, take. Pricing and the support uh, and the SLA, of course, uh, will be uh, can, should be considered for any uh, service or platform that you would buy. And what are the implementation considerations that you have to think? So, in a typical healthcare organization, you would have different data sources. So, your the healthcare platform that you are using should be able to connect to those different data sources. So the data sources can be a different database systems. Uh, they can be relational. Uh, they can be NoSQL. Uh, they can be file servers uh, or uh, basic uh, spreadsheets or the CSV files. So the connectors uh, are very important, and you should your platform should support them. Capability to build fire resources easily. Again, I think I touched upon this, uh, the design considerations as well. So you, you should have your developer accelerators available uh, in the platform. Then it will be easier for you to transform the messages much faster. Availability of fire restful API definitions. So if you look at the fire rest API that I showed, uh, there's a set of standard operations, but each operation uh, defined set of search parameters, or query parameters. So if you are to manually figure out all those and write the API definitions from scratch, that will take a lot of time out of you. So the solution that you are picking uh, should have or should provide you the uh, accelerators or the pre-built API definitions that would help you to start from the base uh, requirements and then uh, build your API uh, definitions uh, on top of that. Time to implement is a key uh, consideration as well. You, know, you should have uh, a training uh, support. You should have uh, services support uh, from the vendor that you are picking up. Uh, Automated CI/CD pipelines, continuous in integration, continuous delivery is a key feature uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, when it comes to the solution, uh, the platform. And you should, uh, you know, the platform should support automated automated deployment of REST APIs. You know, having just the nice UIs wouldn't wouldn't help you to be more productive and more efficient in your uh, release cycles and the development cycles. Infrastructure automation is also a key thing. Uh, so with the fire introduce, introduction of the fire service, you would deploy uh, your uh, fire server deployment in uh, any infrastructure. So having the automated uh, deployment capabilities is a crucial factor. Otherwise, you have to manually maintain them, manually restart uh, the servers, manually scale. Uh, that won't help you in the longer run. Ability to uh, uh, be HIPAA and high trust uh, compliant is also a requirement. Uh, and, uh, you know, the 
HIPAA compliance is basically about the uh, ability that your deployment has in order to comply uh, with the security and the uh, encryption and all the privacy standards. So, uh, you know, the platform you pick should provide those features out of the box so that you can apply them and get those uh, certifications. Documentation and uh, support is also a, a no uh, brainer. It should be uh, available and should be ready to use. So why it is important to build a healthcare integrated platform? So we, have, we are increasingly seeing there are government regulations uh, that are coming into play. So all the governments want to put their citizens uh, or the patients in the healthcare context at the center of their healthcare and basically ensure that they have access to their healthcare information uh, you know, at any given moment of time. And also uh, this kind of a platform would help you to provide better care for your patients or your members. Uh, so basically your members and the patients are the uh, main consumers of yours. And if you do not keep them happy and if you do not provide them the uh, full uh, picture of the of their healthcare, uh, uh, you know, history, then uh, that will basically, uh, you know, make them go away from uh, you as a healthcare provider or a uh, healthcare pair. Ability to move from one pair to another is also increasingly getting a, a, a you know, a valid requirement. Uh, if you move, if you are in the US or the states uh, you if you move from one state to another uh, th there are different local uh, uh, healthcare payers insurance companies uh, so you you can't basically use the same company when you move to the uh, move to a different state so then you have to switch your uh, insurance provider so but if you switch if you are losing all your history uh, all your clinical data and all your uh, uh, financial uh, and administrative data, then that will basically uh, become a problem. Uh, you'd have to, uh, you know, fats, get them fetched, get them uh, somehow delivered via post, etc. Uh, if that is a requirement to your uh, the new pair. Innovate and create new revenue opportunities. So the interoperability shouldn't be considered as a, like a pain. Uh, you should consider as a new business opportunity that you have uh, received and you if you try to innovate and create new revenue opportunities uh, using this uh, interoperability standards you can basically uh, you know uh, monetize the apis that you are exposing uh, from your healthcare solution and uh, start earning uh, more revenue opportunities so uh, as I said in the previous slide, uh, governments are increasingly uh, coming up with regulations <clears throat> to provide patient uh, to the center of the healthcare. Uh, and CMS is, uh, uh, is basically centers for Medicare and Medicaid services. They are a, a company uh, or an organization under United States uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services. So they basically uh, have published a uh, uh, patient access final rule, uh, which would mandate all the uh, Medicare and Medicaid service providers to uh, implement a set of fire APIs and expose them to the uh, external uh, application vendors uh, from uh, July 1st, 2021. So basically the data that you have to expose is claims and encounter data, clinical data, and uh, drug formulary at the uh, first deadline. And then you, sorry, uh, uh, the provider directory in the first deadline and the drug formulary or the payer to payer data exchange uh, for, uh, APIs will have to be exposed uh, on 2022. 
so this wouldn't just be uh, stay uh, just be a rule within the only the us and i think this pattern will follow in other uh, countries uh, other regions uh, across the globe as well so that's why i think uh, getting a head start on the inter interoperability requirements and making and try to innovate and making it a new uh, business opportunity would be a key uh, factor uh, uh, for our uh, future uh, growth. Let's look at the WS2 healthcare integration platform, the reference architecture. Uh, so uh, in a typical uh, healthcare system, you have uh, different data sources, wearable devices, EMR systems like CERN, EPIC. Uh, the health data will still be in uh, different databases. Uh, there can be services. And there can be SaaS applications which are hosted in the cloud app, uh, cloud environments. So, but these are in different data formats. They they might not already be in Fire release for format or the latest Fire format. So you have to convert uh, them uh, into the Fire format uh, in order to expose a proper Fire RESTful API that fits the modern uh, technology uh, requirements. So in order to do that, WSO2 uh, solution basically help, provides you a set of EMR connectors that can be uh, that can connect to CERN and EPIC uh, systems, uh, fire APIs, uh, and uh, you know consume them. And you'll be seeing a demo of this uh, in a bit. Uh, and there, there's a fire data mapping connector for each fire resource. We have built a fire data mapping connector that you can use uh, and use to transform your existing data sources and data formats into the fire format. And uh, we have uh, uh, we are providing fire validators. You can validate the incoming fire messages as well as you can uh, use a fire validator uh, when you uh, implement your integrations. Uh, and when you try to expose a fire server, you can uh, use our fire validator and uh, start to write tests against uh, that. And there are many more uh, fire accelerators we are building, uh, and which some of them are already available as well. But the, the standard is evolving. Uh, there are new extensions coming up. Uh, so uh, this is still, uh, uh, you know, we are basically uh, brainstorming what else we can do uh, to improve uh, or accelerate your um, uh, development. And once you transform your data, the next step would be to uh, expose these uh, data services using a proper managed API. So when I say a proper managed API, that particular API should be uh, properly secured. Uh, it should uh, basically uh, governed you can't have APIs standing there and allowing everyone to be used. Uh, you should rate limit them uh, and you, you should enforce all other quality of service measurements on top of these APIs. So in order to come up with this FHIR APIs, we have a FHIR API definition hub that would allow you to download uh, the API definitions uh, in Swagger and open API specification formats and uh, apply them in the healthcare integration platform and start uh, consuming or start exposing your uh, fire server or the fire APIs uh, to your external application vendors. So WSO2 is open, uh, open ID certified uh, com uh, ident uh, you know, authorization server. Uh, so, but if you have a third party authorization server, we can seamlessly connect to that as well. And there's a developer portal that would uh, expose your APIs uh, to the uh, external uh, application vendors. They can uh, basically uh, consume, start consuming the APIs. And you, finally, you can build smart on fire applications using this uh, uh, fire server that was that is exposed from the WSO2 platform. And we do have analytics capabilities as well. You can do real time uh, and historical analytics as well as monetization uh, of your APIs that you have exposed. 
let's look at the fire accelerators in action. Uh, so uh, the first uh, demo is about uh, showing you how to leverage our uh, CERN and EPIC connectors. So we have these connectors available uh, even now via our connectors too. Uh, so I'm basically going through a simple use case where uh, we are trying to re uh, retrieve uh, patient uh, data uh, from the CERN system. So let's look at the demo. So this is our integration studio where you would build uh, your integration logic by uh, dragging and dropping uh, the mediators. Those are small functional units into the panel. So, uh, and if you look at the source view, it's a very easy to understand uh, high level abstracted syntax. And what does it mean by a connector? So as you can see, I have already added our CERN connector here uh, and it has set of uh, operations available. So a connector is an abstraction uh, on top of the CERN uh, APIs. So uh, you don't have to write uh, HTTP logic, uh, et cetera, in order to consume the API, but you would just uh, use the uh, XML-like syntax and configure the uh, uh, connector and try to use it. And uh, WS2 Studio basically supports, uh, you know, testing the integrations within the studio itself. You can uh, export project artifacts and run. Then uh, the uh, a micro version of the enterprise integrator will be uh, started up within the uh, integration studio, the development environment itself. And once it is started up, you can basically uh, invoke the API uh, using any RS client. Uh, so I'm basically invoking the uh, CERN uh, integration logic we just built, and it is uh, basically returning me the bundle that was returned. Okay, so that is a simple uh, example of how to use the CERN connector. And the next uh, demo is about auto-generatable fire data transformation connectors. So the key here is the auto-generatable uh, thing. Uh, you know, why it is important is fire specification allows extension points. So there can be uh, different extensions. So US, uh, already have uh, extensions published, uh, US Co, uh, US Darwin, CISPAC, uh, uh, US Carrying uh, implementation guide, etc. Similarly, uh, there would be more extensions. So the solution that you are picking should be able to support or give you the connectors uh, in order to leverage uh, those extensions and build the fire resources. So I'll basically uh, quickly go through the design uh, of a connector. So in a mediation flow, you basically uh, taught two different uh, source systems, uh, get the uh, uh, data out of it. You would first create the initial version of the fire resource, and then you would go to another source system, uh, fetch a, a set of missing attributes, missing data from the source two, and then uh, use the operations available in the fire connector to enrich uh, the fire resource that you have just uh, started to build. Uh, you would follow this uh, you know, few times and finally, once you build the fire resource, you can serialize it to XML or JSON format, and then you would be uh, getting the uh, uh, fire resource uh, in the XML JSON format. So I'll quickly show you uh, how it uh, works. So the connectors are available here. You can see we have fire claim connector here, and there's a fire explanation of benefit connector. So uh, likewise, you can add or you know any uh, fire resource related connector to the uh, development environment. And the first thing is you would initialize the fire uh, connectors uh, using the fire init operation. Then you would call the different source systems. And then you would uh, basically uh, start creating the first uh, fire claim uh, resource. You would give, uh, you would set a set of properties. Uh, all the 
all the five attributes of this resource are available to you within the studio. You just have to configure them uh, using uh, its path or you can uh, provide the value as well. Uh, and uh, after that, you would uh, call another endpoint uh, and uh, enrich the same fire resource uh, uh, using a different operation of the fire claim connector. And once you build the full fire message, you would serialize it and send it back to the client. So similarly, we support fire bundle connector as well. Uh, if you are familiar with the specification, uh, there's a way to bundle uh, multiple resources. Uh, within the same uh, fire response, uh, and that will best basically uh, you know embed uh, different fire resources into the bundle. You can use that add resource of operation of the fire bundle uh, to uh, add the uh, resources, and then finally you can serialize it and send it back to the client. So that's a high level, very quick demo uh, on the fire connector. Uh, and the API definitions is the next uh, uh, segment where uh, once you um, once you expose a fire once you want to expose a fire API, you basically want to have the fire API definition at your hand. It's very uh, hard and cumbersome to build it uh, manually. So WSO2 is hosting a fire API hub. Uh, where it ho we will host the Swagger and the Open API spe specification related definitions. <clears throat> uh, you can basically search for the uh, uh, relevant fire resource you want, and uh, then uh, basically uh, try to uh, get the uh, API definition of this. Uh, and um, you should be able to download it uh, from the uh, Fire API Hub. And once you uh, download the API definition, you can go to the uh, API uh, publisher, the designer, and uh, import it. Uh, and I will, to save time, I will skip that part. And I've already imported the explanation of benefit uh, resource here. You can see here the fire resources, all the full, full API definition is available. And you can see the uh, query parameters are also available defined for you so you don't have to worry anything you just need to configure your endpoint and then uh, if you want to change anything else you can do that and then once you publish the api the api will be available in the uh, developer portal this is the place where your application developers would come and discover the apis uh, they can basically uh, see, you know go through the documentation of the api try them out uh, and if they want to subscribe to the APIs and generate tokens, they can basically create an application and uh, they can subscribe the APIs they want and they can build uh, the keys as well. So once you get the client ID, client secret, you should be able to uh, basically expose uh, you know, create your application and embed those and build the uh, uh, application to consume the API. So uh, at, to end the uh, presentation, I'll basically do an end-to-end -end, uh, demo of the full uh, use case, how everything works, uh, you know, uh, at one t at one go. Uh, so the, the scenario is basically consume access their claims data. So I'll explain the sequence uh, uh, when I do the demo, but uh, the setup is something like this. There's WSO2 Healthcare Integration Platform, there's a browser-based application, and there's database uh, as the data source. So, let me out quite quickly and Okay, so this is my applications, uh, insurance one. Uh, I, as a patient uh, or a member, login in uh, to the application. Uh, so uh, once I click on the login button, uh, button I, will, I was redirected to the authorization server. This is the WSO2 Healthcare Integration Platform. And I need to enter my credentials. 
And once I authorize myself to access the patient data, uh, I basically give my consent to the application to access the APIs on behalf of me. And once I do that, uh, I'll be able to uh, retrieve uh, the data from the uh, Fire API. So here you, you can see the uh, Fire API detail. This was the API request that was sent to the Fire server and the server returned a Fire bundle in the XML format in this case. But uh, you, you can uh, define the message format uh, in the accept header and the server will uh, respond uh, based on that. And if you want to drill down and see uh, details of one explanation of benefit, you can click on uh, uh, that and then it will basically bring, bring up the details of the explanation of benefit. So that's basically the demo part of it. I think I'm running out of time. I want to keep some time for the questions as well. So um, there are the uh, accelerators we are working on. Uh, but you can check out if you are interested to see a full end-to-end -end demo and with more detailed uh, conversation, uh, please uh, visit our website, web page, and uh, you know, contact us by clicking on clicking schedule a demo, uh, and uh, you will be will be happy to help you. Happy to have you have a discussion with you, and try to see how we can help you to. Uh, one thing to become compliant uh, with the regulation, CMS regulation. And also if you are out of the US uh, and if you don't have any compliance requirements, but still if you'd like to take a head start on this in interoperability journey with WSO2, you can basically uh, contact us and we'll be happy to help. Uh, do we have any questions? We have uh, panelists joining, uh, helping me here. Let me check whether there are any questions. I think there are a few questions. Uh, so let me see. Yeah, uh, so you'd be getting the recording post the session. Uh, and uh, this WS2 provides fire accelerators for SAS and on-premise model. Uh, so if your EMR is in the uh, cloud somewhere, uh, and uh, if, if it has a well-defined API interface, we can write a connect and provide that to you. Uh, so that would be your fire accelerator. Uh, but currently we support CERN and EPIC uh, fire APIs, uh, but if there are any other SaaS applications, we can provide that to you. Slides will be sent after the session uh, within uh, one to two days. Uh, converting from HL7 to Fire or any backend data, legacy layer data to Fire. Yes, so uh, any message format within the integration platform will be converted firstly into XML. And from the XML structure, you can XML or JSON structures, you can convert them to Fire using our Fire accelerators. IoT-based application. Uh, okay, what about IoT-based application that are non-REST-based? So the Fire API currently basically, uh, you know, encourages you to use the REST API standard. But uh, if you have uh, non-RESTful uh, uh, client applications, we have to think what is the way to in incorporate with them. If you are interested, uh, you can um, get on a, you know, get on a discussion with us and we'll be happy to help. How, how does, uh, how does WCT and Swagger support multiple profiles of the same uh, fire resource on the same fire server? since the context root represents the specific fire resource. Yes, so yes, this is a uh, you know, good question. So for an example, uh, when it comes to explanation of benefit, uh, you know, there's an international standard as well as a US uh, uh, carrying uh, implementation standard. 
So likewise, there can be more standards. So the context, API context have to, you know, you, you can of course change the context to reflect that. That's, a, that's one simple option. But if you want to keep the explanation of benefit itself, then I think uh, we have to decide uh, after taking the uh, API request into the platform, we have to write some orchestration logic that would route the request uh, based on the standard uh, based by looking at the header, looking at a header or something like that. Um, will this fire connector supports the EI640 version? Uh, we have currently tested it on uh, 650, uh, but it should support 640 as well, but uh, that we have to double check. Uh, and I think uh, if you can contact us, uh, we'll be able to uh, help you. Is it possible to build custom connectors using the same framework? Yes, uh, so the custom connectors, building a custom connect is uh, quite straightforward. There's a well-defined extension point, uh, you know, interface that you have to implement uh, and you can add operations. There's a way of doing uh, you know, that. Uh, we can give you more information if you are interested. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, how do you see payers providers monetizing fire APIs? Yes, so uh, that's again an interesting question. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. This is where the innovation uh, of each of the payer or the provider would come into play in my opinion. So they can start thinking how to make these interoperability requirements or the fire APIs a new uh, revenue opportunity or a business opportunity to their organization and uh, you know and start to expose these apis or special apis from your organization to the uh, other partners or uh, different uh, other providers uh, etc so that uh, they can, if they are earning revenue, they'd be happy to share some of those revenue or pay for the APIs that they would use. Uh, other than REST, is there support for GraphQL in the fire spec? Fire specification mentions uh, that they are working on a GraphQL standard, but uh, as, well, as far as I remember, they specifically mentioned that it is not uh, fully, you know, it's still in the draft stage. It is not, uh, uh, you know, standardized like the RESTful API. So it is still a draft in the fire spec. Um, but uh, I think draft QL would be an next option. So that's why that's a good question. Actually, you have to think, uh, you know, if the draft QL APIs are becoming increasingly popular, so the framework, the solution you pick today should support GraphQL uh, APIs as well if you are planning to uh, expose uh, uh, even fire over GraphQL. So WSO2 uh, supports uh, GraphQL uh, APIs, but for this fire thing, uh, currently we don't uh, support uh, since the fire specification is still a draft uh, for the GraphQL. How does the fire hub uh, differ from the WSO2 API manager? So Fire Hub is just the uh, you know, place where you can go and download the saga definitions for all the Fire resources. It does not allow you to generate keys, tokens, or anything like that. Uh, why we have done it that way is, uh, you know, as you can imagine, uh, there are you know hundreds of Fire resources available in different different standards. So, but you as an organization would need only a subset of uh, those fire resources. So that's why we have uh, we took a decision to keep a fire hub uh, open and available to our customers so that they can pick and choose what are the definitions that they want to uh, use. And then they can import them to the API designer as I showed in the demo. Uh, at slide, at slide 
uh, at slide 20, did you say patient access API deadline is July 2021? Maybe I misread the slide. Uh, no, uh, it is July 2021. I think CMS gave an extension due to the current COVID situation. If you go to the CMS uh, web page, they have uh, mentioned now the deadline, they, they have moved the first deadline by six months so that uh, companies would get a chance to implement uh, the uh, uh, implement the APIs before the deadline. So. Uh, think that's. Uh, I think I couldn't answer all the questions, but we are, you know, almost at the time, uh, top of the hour. Uh, so we'll be uh, getting in touch with you. I think we'll we'll have all the questions. If anything wasn't answered uh, during the session, we'll be in touch with you and we'll answer you. Of course, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us uh, by clicking, go to going to our website uh, and clicking on the uh, contact us form. Uh, and also, we have a we have our second webinar on this series coming up, and the webinar page is already up. Uh, once you get the slides, you can uh, uh, check uh, that out and register to that webinar as well. So thank you everyone for joining this session. I hope the session was useful and gave you a, like a high level overview as to what you should expect uh, in the interoperability uh, space. Uh, and uh, let's uh, connect, get connected uh, and we can do, I, I know I had to rush a bit at the end uh, due to the time constraint, but uh, if you want a more uh, custom, uh, focused a detailed uh, session uh, let's you can get in touch with us and we'll be happy to repeat uh, or do a, a customized uh, session for you so uh have a good uh, day uh, uh, everyone uh, thanks for joining the session again